Hey everybody, Dr. Osborne here. Welcome to a special interview I've put together with an amazing doctor and woman. Dr. Krupa George is here to join us today to talk about biological dentistry and how traditional dentistry might be poisoning your body. So we're gonna dive right in. Dr. George, thank you for being here in studio with us today and uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Hi, it's an honor to be here. I'm happy to share my knowledge with everyone because I know there's so many questions about dentistry and especially biological dentistry, right? So I'm not happy to be here. So, so first tell us a little bit about your background, your education. Okay, so I went to school at the University of Texas and got my doctorate there. Um, and after, before that, I went to A&M, Texas A&M University. Texas A&M. So what is biological dentistry? Like, what does that mean? Is that more <laughs> education? Is that more schooling? What does that hmm. look like? You know, that's a good question. I actually did not go to school. There's actually no biological specialty. It's not a real specialty. But the main philosophy about biological dentistry is that we want to get to the root cause of the problems instead of just having patients come to us and drill their teeth and fix them with fillings. Biological dentists want to avoid toxic materials in the mouth, like mercury, like fluoride, um, BPAs, anything that could be toxic to the whole body. And we also account for other things that can happen in the, the whole body by looking at the mouth. So almost like functional medicine for the mouth versus, you know, that's the way I look at it. Traditional medicine is is symptom resolution through chemical mm -hmm. manipulation, um, and modern dentistry is symptom resolution through surgical manipulation, and sometimes through chemical manipulation, but you're looking for root cause of oral, oral problems. That's right, yeah, we wanna to get to the root cause and prevent that same problem from happening again, and even prevent other problems from happening inside the body. Right. Excellent, so let's, let's talk about some of the most common things that you see uh, in the field of dentistry, and, I, and again, I, I want to be very clear to our audience, this is not Dr. Osborne ragging on dentists. Look, I think my son's going to be a dentist very soon, and I, I just think there's a need in the profession for some awareness. And so I think dentists do a great job, but I think a better job could be done, which is why I have Dr. George on the show. So I don't want any of my dentist audience getting upset with me over this, but let's talk about what, what are some of the fundamental issues in dentistry today? I mean, you mentioned silver mm -hmm. or mercury fillings. Can you talk a little bit to, to why that practice is still done, but shouldn't be? No, yeah, you're right, because I used to do fillings, silver mercury fillings, when I was in school. I was taught that way, and so it's not the fault of a lot of dentists, it's just maybe they don't know. They don't know how toxic it was, and I didn't realize that as well myself until I started learning more about toxic mercury in the mouth and all the effects it can have. So mercury is so toxic. I don't know why it's still being put in the mouth, but I have a feeling it's because it's not regulated right now inside the mouth. But I've seen the symptoms of mercury toxicity, um, as in memory fog, for example, um, dizziness. You just, I recommend my patients to go and get a heavy metal test because if they have mercury fillings in the mouth, they're rubbing off and that mercury is getting into the body and causing other symptoms, uh, other issues that you may not even know it's related to the mercury. So you, you would take somebody, for example, who has silver fillings and the potential for that mercury vapor to release uh, and become toxic for them, you would, you would say, go see a doctor, get yourself tested for mercury toxicity, um, because if it is a problem, we probably should get that, that filling out. Is that kind of the way you handle it? Or do you say, because uh, this is a question I get a lot, mm -hmm. and I'm not a dentist. So if somebody doesn't have mercury toxicity through testing, do you still recommend they get the mercury or silver amalgam out? Or is it less of a priority? How do you, how do you look at that? Definitely. So any kind of mercury in the mouth is being emitted vapor into the body. Um, so I don't care if, there's to if they're toxic yet or they're not toxic yet. I don't need a test, but I can tell just by looking at mercury in the mouth that it's causing the little vapors to be rubbed off. When you're eating any food, if you eat anything hot or cold, vapors get rubbed off in, on the teeth and it goes inside the body. And so why would I want that in, some, in one of my patient's mouth? You know, yeah. I don't need a doctor to tell me, oh, this patient is toxic and then to remove it. I want to be preventative and take it out before that happens. So then you, you would just refer somebody out if they were mercury toxic to do additional type of treatment 
or additional mm -hmm. type of um, like chelation, for example, yeah. to help remove the mercury once it's established uh, inside mm -hmm. their tissues and, and creating a problem for them. Yeah, every patient that I remove mercury on, uh, before and after, I do recommend that they use a practitioner that understands heavy metals and how it can affect the body to help them detox, either chelate or help a detox protocol for the patients individually to kind of detox all the mercury when we remove it. Okay, so, so what I hear you saying then is get it out of your mouth. Yeah. Whether it's become mercury poisoning for you at, at that point or not, doesn't really matter. We don't want to wait for that to happen. Mm -hmm. What do you replace it with? You know, you, you know, I mean, here was the argument. I was talking to a dentist and he said, look, silver's the most stable of fillings. Like from, from the perspective of if we're going to use a material that has a really long shelf life and lasts and does a really good job, that's why we choose this one. What, what do you say to that versus um, some of the new uh, new filling agents? You just said silver. I just, that's a big misnomer now because it's not a silver filling. There's less silver in that filling than there is mercury. There's 50% of that filling is mercury. And so that's why I so just want to correct you there. It's a mercury filling, not a silver filling. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, the thing is, it doesn't it lasts long, sure. It's a metal, but they do crack. Metal shrinks, expands. So that shrinking and expansion inside the tooth creates cracks on the teeth. So how is that, how is that okay to be put in someone's mouth? Right? Okay, well, and thanks, so, yeah, thanks yeah. for that clarification. Yeah, it's, it's stable, sure, if you put mercury on the table or something, it's, it's stable there. But inside your mouth where you're eating hot and cold food, it's not really stable. So it's kind of like the plumbing under the house if the <laughs> ground freezes, right? Yeah. It, it contracts and expands with the ground and, and that yeah. can crack, actually damage the teeth. So what about, what about natural fillings? What, what, what do you recommend for people nowadays? What, what okay. kind of options are there? So filling materials, there's so many different types of filling material. Um, there's no real standard for filling materials. You can put anything in the mouth, right? But there's certain filling materials that are more compatible with the body than others. I recommend no BPAs in the filling materials, no fluoride in there. There's some materials that are more compatible with the body than others. And so that's how I picked my filling materials at my office. What, so you say more compatible. Is there a way to know? Like what is it that you do that helps you understand what works better for you know, Mrs. Jones versus Mr. Jones, for yeah. example? Yeah, that's a good question. We can actually test each person based on either muscle testing or acupuncture or blood test. We can use a variety of tests to figure out what type of filling is going to be best for that person. So the, so the old adage, the whole one-size-fits-all dentistry is, is really, in your opinion, a thing of the past or should be. Yes, it should be. Yeah, you can't just use the same brand for everybody, especially someone that is very sick already. Someone that has an autoimmune condition needs to be tested before we can put anything in the mouth. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's fillings. We know now that they're silver and not, are not silver, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> silver, mercury fillings, 50% or more um, is, is mercury, right? Mm -hmm. And so not a good idea. Um, biocompatibility, meaning testing the patient for the material that would best fit their teeth to fill their cavities is the way to go. Um, is, there, is there any other, so we talk about fillings, let's talk a little bit about root canals because I know that's another mm -hmm. really big and common procedure that's done in dentistry today. What's your opinion about a root canal? So I just want to explain first what a root canal is. So a root canal is a, is a dead tooth. The doctor will go in there take the nerve out and, and try and clean out the tooth by removing the nerve, right? And they'll fill it up with some filling material. But the thing is, the tooth is not like a rock. There's not only just two nerves in there or three nerves. There's all these little tubules and holes in the tooth that still hide and collect bacteria. So in my opinion, there's no a way that a tooth can really be cleaned out. So the bacteria hides in the tooth. Someone that gets a root canal treatment eventually finds that tooth comes back reinfected. So I actually don't recommend root canals. I leave it up to the patients if they want to do a root canal. I have to refer them to another dentist that wants to do a root canal. Okay, so is a root canal just a less expensive option than, than say, um, well, I mean, what would you do versus a root canal? If you weren't gonna do a root canal, what, what would you recommend instead? Okay, so if the tooth has gotten to the point where there's a large infection at the root and a root canal is being recommended, the alternative the best alternative is typically a zirconia implant, and that is a metal-free implant. So an implant is great because it's sturdy, it's stable, it doesn't come out of the mouth, it just feels like a real tooth. So I would say let's replace the whole infected tooth with a zirconia implant. 
So let's backtrack just a minute. So let's say somebody has a root canal. Um, what, what you're saying is there's this risk for bacteria to grow um, in the crevices of that tooth where, where the root canal just didn't get it clean enough. And that can manifest as what? Is it an infection? Like how does that, what, what happens there? And, and how does somebody know if a root canal is bad? Is it, do they all have pain? Is there some type of symptom that they look for? It, tell us a little bit about how, to, how the person watching this today can understand whether their root canal is a problem for them or whether it's not a problem, whether they should consider a zirconian implant. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. So a root canal, um, being in the body already, has infection inside the tooth, but eventually it's gonna start puffing that infection area into the bone, into your jawbone or into the, the maxillary bone. And so people might see that they have an abscess in the mouth. They might have like a bump or a pus ball. And that's when you know that infection is already getting so bad that it's exposing into the gum. Um, so I don't think it's okay to leave any root canals inside the mouth because that's a dead part of the body. So I don't know any specialty that leaves a dead part of the body inside the like body. No surgeons leave dead yeah. tissue behind? Yeah, you don't leave a dead finger behind if it's dead or anything like that. So my opinion, we should get that root canal to tooth out from the body. We should clean out all the infection, make sure it heals really nicely, and then we should think about how we're gonna replace the tooth if it needs a replacement. Okay, and, 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 and so with tooth replacement, you recommend zirconian uh, over any other type of metal implant, correct? Yeah, so I don't like to have metal in the mouth. It doesn't make sense to me. Why would I want to put some sort of metal in the mouth? And a lot of implants that most dentists are doing nowadays are made from titanium, which is metal. It's a silver looking screw that goes in the mouth. And, but there is an alternative. There's a ceramic zirconia implant and that looks white. It doesn't collect, conduct electricity. It's not metal. Um, and so I think it's more compatible with most people. And we can test it too if someone wants to know if zirconia is more compatible to them, and we can test that further. So going back to the biocompatibility that you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, you can test fillings, but yeah. you can test other dental materials and, and surgical implants, implant materials that, that might better fit for that patient, correct? Yeah, we can test everything. We can test the anesthetic type. We can test the gels that we use in the mouth, what type of stitches we're going to be using, anything that's going to stay in the mouth for a while, we're gonna test that to make sure it's compatible. I like that, so uh, n again, not a one size fits all approach mm -hmm. for, for dentistry. So root, can I'm gonna go back again to root canal. Um, how do you identify an infection in a root canal or do you just make the assumption that if there is a root canal, that there's an infection in it? Uh, well, I actually have removed lots of root canal treated teeth and I test them, I send them to the lab and I want to find out what bacteria was associated with that root canal, I don't always have to wait for the x-ray to show me there's an infection. I know that when I send that tooth to the lab, there's going to be bacteria showing up that's associated with viruses, pathogens, parasites. There's so many teeth that are associated with all these bacteria that don't show infection on the x-ray. Okay, so we can test that. I have lots of ways to test root canal treated teeth. Um, to let patients know that this is causing a burden to their body. Uh, you may not even feel anything if you have a root canal because essentially it's a dead tooth. You might not feel that it's hurting. So there's no way to tell if that root canal tooth is, is actually infected unless you just see a dentist, like a biological dentist, and they can point you in the right direction. But typically, uh, Dr. Osborne, I'm gonna recommend let's take out and replace every root canal treated tooth. So I've seen people come to me um, where we changed their diet, you know, we got them dialed in, they, we got them gluten free, we got them allergen free, we got them well nutritionally supported, they're sleeping well, they're getting exercise the way that they should, but they're still struggling with their, you know, with their condition and a lot of these people are, you know, painful degenerative um, autoimmunities. Um, and then we find out there's an infected root canal or we find out there's a problem and all the diet and lifestyle change they did got them to a certain point but they were plateaued in, in their care and it wasn't until identifying that root canal infection and getting it removed that we see kind of a better recovery or, or a, mm -hmm. a, we'll just say a better outcome for them is that something you see commonly oh, people yeah. that have yeah i illness? see that a lot actually i have patients that have gone to so many doctors they've done so much they've they've gotten quite better but they still have some symptoms like they have, I had this one patient, 
Um, she had nausea, memory fog. She had muscle weakness all over. She couldn't even pick up her grandkids. She looked so healthy from the outside, right? But she knew that there was something else going on, and she had root canals. She had actually eight teeth that had root canals. Oh, wow. So uh, we actually did surgery. We made sure those were cleaned out nicely. And just in about two or three days after the surgery, uh, she, her nausea was gone. She was able to actually eat normal food again because there were so many foods she couldn't eat. Um, so that was, that was crazy. So eight, symptoms, eight, really. is that an extreme case, eight root canals? Or I mean, do people have, I mean, a lot of people out there, maybe one, mm -hmm. maybe two, but eight, I mean, that's quite a few. Yeah, I mean, uh, some common? people just have one root canal treated tooth that we remove and they see differences. They can feel their body, their health getting better. My, my, eight, my thought yeah. was that the eight, now, you've, now we're pulling eight teeth, right? Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, I, I just think about what I know about bone healing. Like we've got eight teeth that have been removed from the mouth. Now we've got to put eight implants potentially in. Is that something that, you know, the implants are done all at once? Do you do one at a time? Um, you know, what do you consider nutritionally to help support that that, that, that mm -hmm. implant actually takes into the bone and the bone actually grows well and attaches to the implant well so that it's a successful outcome. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Like I really need to make sure that we have the vitamin levels healthy even before I do an extraction because I need that bone site to, before I remove any teeth, I need to make sure vitamin D level, vitamin K levels are healthy, um, that the patient may be seeing a functional medicine doctor to make sure their micronutrient levels are healthy. And then the bone heals nicely. For that patient, we actually had to do a couple of teeth at a time. It wasn't done all at once. Uh, implants typically can be placed multiple at a time. It's less invasive, but we just need to have good, healthy bone. And you know, I always recommend good bone broth to my patients, uh, vitamins that, that help bone grow properly. Do you, do you ever find the need for cadaver bone or, you know, I mean, you know, we're talking about biological, yeah. you know, versus traditional dentistry. Like what, what is your opinion about, about something like that? I don't find that cadaver bone or cow bone, bovine, any kind of bone from someone else integrates very well and takes into someone's body. So I don't use that. I actually use uh, patient's own blood plasma to fill in whole sites and okay. it heals really nicely. So you actually draw their own Yeah, I blood. draw blood and I, and I use a centrifuge to get the plasma part. And I put the little plasma pellets and I put that inside the hole and I stitch it up and in one week, the gums are already healing much better than I've seen with cadaver bone or bovine bone. Oh, fantastic. So yeah. that's something yeah. I hadn't yet heard of. So mm -hmm. using plasma to help, yeah. to help them heal better. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've, we've talked about mercury fillings. We've mm -hmm. talked about root canals as being a problem. What other types of common procedures or are there any other things that you want to make our audience aware of that could be a potential downfall for their health and not in their best interest, dentally speaking? Well, um, most of patients of mine already know that fluoride is toxic, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands that fluoride is a toxic product. It's a byproduct that a lot of people have been put in their water or toothpaste, but now we're coming to find that fluoride is not really good for the overall health of your body. So it blocks thyroid uptake of iodine. Iodine is blocked when you have fluoride. Um, I haven't really found great studies that support fluoride in, in reversing cavities, there's a lot of other better alternatives to using fluoride. So, so or, fluoride, I mean, my, my experience know. with fluoride is it's a poison. Yeah. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, we know it blocks iodine uptake, but um, the research that really began fluoridation to me was very loosely done and very poorly done, and it really created a foundation for, gosh, how long have we been fluoridating the water over 50 years that should never have been 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 going on in the first place. So you're not a big fan of fluoridated toothpaste or fluoridated mouthwash? You don't do the fluoride rinse trays in people's mouths? No, we don't have any fluoride products in my office. Okay. I, I recommend water filters that fl like take out fluoride for water at home. Okay, so like a reverse osmosis water yeah, filter. Yeah, reverse osmosis. Okay. And, and do you recommend when people use RO that they remineralize their water after they've, mm -hmm. after they've filtered it? I think so. Yeah, we're stripping all the minerals from when we do the reverse osmosis, so we need to put the minerals back in there. Okay. So fluoridation, what else? Any other, any other mm. mainstays in, in common dentistry practice that, that yeah. could be revamped? So just, just so I used to work in a you know, fast-paced corporate office. 
And so I kind of understood why a lot of dentists are doing what they do. And I found that a lot of dentists prescribe crowns. Now a crown is uh, where you take away all the enamel from the tooth. You know, I realized why they do it because insurance, a lot of patients base their dental care on insurance, right? So insurance pays more for a crown. They pay more for a root canal. Um, but insurance doesn't really care about the patient's overall health. But if we're taking away all this enamel to make a crown, when we could have done a filling, that maybe takes more time and uses more expensive material, but we're saving that patient's tooth from being drilled down so much, um, I think that's the better way to go. So a lot more fillings should be prescribed than crowns, in my opinion. So, so maybe the insurance covers the crown, so it's cheaper for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, but in the long run, more expensive for the patient probably because their, their, their dental health is deteriorated. Is that, is that right. accurate? Yeah, in the long run, if you get a crown and something happens to that crown, the next thing you're probably going to need is a root canal. Okay. So that's expensive too. So if you think about it, you want to save your teeth in the short term and get the best care in the beginning, the first step before you drill your teeth down and have to get so much dental work. So, so it goes cavity. Yeah. Crown, root canal, yeah, right? Pretty much. And, yeah. What about bridges? Is that yeah. is that just where you have teeth that fall out and you have to literally create a bridge so that there's a chewing surface? It, it literally is a bridge, right? So instead of one crown, you have two crowns. On two healthy teeth, uh, you're going to drill all the enamel down from two healthy teeth and make a bridge from those two teeth to create a fake tooth in the middle. My best idea would be to do an implant instead. It doesn't create any enamel loss, and it's sturdy, and in the end, you don't have to ruin two healthy teeth. So they ruin two mm -hmm. to create chewing surface. Yeah. Now, I don't know, I mean, some people's argument is this, right? That, that implants are super expensive, and I just can't afford an implant. And my argument in, in return is, it's not my concern what you can or can't afford, it's my concern that you're healthy, right? And that if, you're, if you lose your capacity to chew well, then your nutrition is going to deteriorate over time. And that's probably going to be far more expensive than any implant that you put in your mouth. Like that's just the way I see it. How, how do you look at that? No, oh, yeah, you're right. So as a doctor and, you know, as a doctor, we don't have to think about patient's checkbook because we're thinking about their health, right? And so if we're thinking about their health, we're going to recommend what's best for them and not what their insurance will cover or what's cheaper right now, but, you know, future long-term treatment. And, and of course, ultimately, the best way to not need a root canal or a cavity is what? Is, is probably proper diet, nutrition. Nutrition, yeah. diet, let's, let's work on that. That'll be the best thing, you know. Yeah. yeah. So I, I know sugar has been the bane of, of dentistry. Like that, I guess you could say that the devil of dentistry is, is sugar. Do you find other foods commonly that people eat that contribute to poor oral yeah. hygiene and health? Yeah, yeah. There's so many foods that people don't understand converts to sugar right away, like, like white bread, any kind of carbs, bread or uh, crackers, that, that is going to turn into sugar right away. And if it's sitting on the teeth, that's, that's going to cause a cavity. Um, so best diet I would recommend is more of like a keto diet, meat and vegetables. Um, also gluten-free would be good because, you know, that's already taking out most of your carbs by just going gluten-free. Um, making sure that the diet is alkaline alkalizing your diet, making sure the pH of your saliva is alkaline instead of an acidic pH. And so, so. do you recommend people use pH strips or? Yeah, if, if they have an alkaline or acidic pH when they come to my office, I recommend let's take a look at your diet. Is there anything that we could do for you? And then they can, you can, you can easily buy some pH strips from Amazon and check your saliva pH because if you have an acidic pH of your saliva, it's going to cause you to have cavities pretty quickly. So what? What's the number people are looking for in the pH spectrum for a healthy pH in the mouth? Uh, you know, like 6.5, about 7 at least. Okay. So 6.5 yeah. to 7 is a good, a good place to be. And if they're under that 6.5, it's too acidic and they're, mm -hmm. they're more apt to form cavities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so the acid could be coming from diet. It could also be coming from acid reflux. That's associated with sleep disorders. It could be coming from a lot of different things. But... Just so that we know that the saliva is acidic, then we already know they're at risk for getting more cavities. Okay, interesting. So uh, eating well is the best prevention. Yeah. Uh, and some people would even argue that it's too expensive to buy organic. Mm -hmm. I would say it's far more expensive in the long run to live with heart disease, diabetes, obesity, 
uh, autoimmune disease and the sequelae of those diseases, which is multiple medications, multiple surgeries, a deterioration of dental health, and, and a, a downward spiral of your quality of life. So a little prevention goes a long way, I think, huh? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So you spend the money up front, so you don't have to spend millions more down the line, right? Yeah, for sure. So we got, again, just in summary, we've got the mercury fillings, we've got the root canal, we've got mm -hmm. the bridge, we've got the fluoridation. Did we cover everything? Is there anything else you'd like to make hmm. the audience aware of? Um, just trying to think. Let's see. Yeah, root canals are really bad, and you know a lot of dentists are prescribing them now. What about metal wire braces? Um, a lot of people find that your gums get like really red and swollen when you have those wire braces on, but not a lot of dentists are understanding that it's happening because you have wire in your mouth or metal in the mouth that your body is allergic to. So that's why your gums, if you have braces on, kids, a, lot of, a lot of kids I see this all the time, they have really puffy red gums. And now that's typically because they have a metal allergy to those wires on the teeth. So does that go back to the material compatibility testing before making the decision for wire versus what are the other brace options that you would recommend? Yeah. Yeah, so I typically would recommend a wire metal free brace using Invisalign or something that's not metal at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So testing them first. Testing and, first. And, uh, yeah. and then making the appropriate recommendation mm -hmm. for, for whatever they need. Yep, exactly. Okay. okay. So let's talk about something I know everybody's thinking about. Like it's the top of mind for most adults, mm -hmm. right? And that's, you know, they drink coffee at breakfast, they drink yeah. tea, their teeth get a little dark as they get a little bit older. What's the best way to not destroy your teeth, but mm -hmm. to get them to whiten naturally? Like what's the, what's the best way in your opinion to do that? So there's an easy way. If it's a surface stain, that's maybe just some, some coffee over you know a few weeks ago, you can brush with hydrogen peroxide. Um, you know, you can dilute it if you need to. I'm not prescribing it. There could be complications, but you need to be careful with how much you use. But hydrogen peroxide is very inexpensive. It can remove very shallow stains. And I like that even in my water pick because it kills bacteria um, inside the gums as well. So, you, so, so, so tell me about that. So you have a water pick and we'll, let's talk about that yeah, too. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm a big fan of water picks. I mm -hmm. really think those are great for good hygiene. Um, how much peroxide are you putting in the water pick? So like most of them have like a chamber for water, right? Yeah. So you, you put like a thimble full, do you put how much, you know? I put like a two ounces in my water, it's like, you know, about this big. You can estimate it, there's no real direction to it, but I, I'd recommend about two ounces of hydrogen peroxide. Okay, and just water picking the teeth with the hydrogen peroxide? I like, I like to do hydrogen peroxide, but I also use essential oils. I use essential oils inside my water, in the water basket to give it the antimicrobial action when I'm cleaning out the gums. So what's your favorite essential oil to use? Oh, I have this blend in my office. It's from Aura Wellness, and it has a blend of spearmint, peppermint, um, eucalyptus oil. There's, there's a couple of different ones in there. Okay, so essential oils and peroxide, great in a water pick yeah. for, for dental hygiene. Mm -hmm. so, so better than floss? Oh, you know what? Actually, I don't floss myself. So I had to create some other ideas because I hate flossing, that string just annoys me. And I found these really amazing gum brushes. They have these little fibers of silicon on there. And so the brush actually cleans better, it cleans your gums better than the floss, the string of floss. Um, there's only one brand that I found that has these little silicon fibers on it and it's TP. T-E-P-E, that brand. T-E-P-E, -E. Yeah. and it's a silicone brush. So that, that little, little gum brushes that you can put between your gums and clean them out. And if you, okay. if you find that there, there's blood coming out, it's a sign that you have gum disease. And you need okay. probably go see your dentist. So if you're, if you're doing this and bleeding, same thing with flossing, if they yeah. floss, right? If they're if seeing floss. a lot of blood come out and they've yeah. got some type of gingivitis or, or something happening, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. So water picks, silicone versus, uh, is it silicone or silica? Silicon. Okay. It's like this little fiber of silicon fibers. Um, it's just because the other ones that are plastic, it doesn't have enough fibers to really clean the brush, the gum out. Well, so I would I say to... too, people that are worried about plastic exposure and the potential for phthalate mm -hmm. on, the, on the floss itself yeah. could, be, could yeah. be better served by that as well. Okay, so 
Again, water pick with essential oil, hydrogen peroxide, some, some silicon um, floss versus the traditional floss. Um, what about toothbrushes? Do, do you, I mean, there's, there's the ultrasonic type, you know, there's, there's, of course, your traditional type, but do you, do you recommend kind of natural fiber toothbrush versus the other kind, or do you recommend the ultrason, uh, ultrasonic versions at all? Um, so you mean there's like electric toothbrushes or one that you, you manually use? I think whatever is working best in that patient, in, in that person's hands, for me, I like a manual toothbrush. I just feel like I can actually get to the right spots. I know where to clean. But for my other patients that, you know, that don't know exactly where they're cleaning, electric toothbrushes are great. Something with a small little head that can actually go into the small areas of the mouth are really good. Um, there's one brand that I really like. It's called a Burst toothbrush. Um, and it's, it's affordable. The fibers are charcoal infused. And um, I really like that. So there's an electric toothbrush I like. There's lots of different brands of electric toothbrushes, though. I just think the, the toothbrush head is what's important. Okay. Extra soft toothbrush head is what we need. Extra not, soft. Not soft, extra soft. Not extra hard. No, definitely not <laughs> extra hard. We're not scrubbing a toilet here. We're just, we're just scrubbing your teeth. You, you can damage them if you scrub too hard. Okay, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I, I do. I've had people come in and they're like, look at my gums. And... and they have extra hard toothbrushes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, on, that, on that same note of toothbrushes, so we're looking at extra soft, charcoal, the tip is good. Some people do better with electric, some people do it better with manual. Mm -hmm. That's not really the deal breaker as far as oral hygiene is concerned. Yeah. Um, let's talk about pain. Common question. Somebody has a toothache and they can't get in for two or three weeks to see their dentist. Um, or, or, you know, what do, what do you use? Because, you know, Ibuprofen damages the gut lining and causes, yeah. uh, you know, stomach bleeding and intestinal bleeding, and probably damages gum tissue too. It's the same type of tissue. Um, Tylenol damages the liver, causes vitamin C loss and glutathione loss, which isn't good for liver detoxification. What do you, what do you what do you recommend for managing pain? You know, as in a, in a I should say, because I know there are different levels of pain. Like there's toothache, right? Where somebody's yeah. like, holy cow, I got to get out of pain. I can't handle it. And then there's like dull, low-grade, achy toothache. Kind of walk us through what you can recommend in okay. that regard. Yeah, so depending on how you react to it, I like to start with just homeopathics. It's, it's natural. It can work great. Um, you can even get them from Whole Foods, Sprouts. They have Byron, you know, sells them at most, uh, I guess, health stores now. So Arnica Montana is good for pain, and there's so many different brand, or brands and different types of homeopathics you can get, but that's something that we use at our office too. Where after extractions and surgeries, we actually give our patients homeopathics, especially for x-rays as well. <laughs> so, yeah, let's, I, I like where this is going. Yeah. Um, so they don't need... Tylenol or ibuprofen per se, like we don't have to baby them, right? Uh, I mean, maybe some people do, but a lot of patients of mine are, are doing really good with just homeopathic medications for pain and healing. It okay. works really good. So you, you mentioned post-surgery. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about antibiotics because this is one of those mm -hmm. things where common dentistry, I get this all the time. People come to me, my dentist says I need to take antibiotics before every cleaning preventatively. And like there's no basis for that. Not scientifically, not in the medical literature, not to my knowledge. Now, I'm not also I'm, I'm not a dentist, so could you shed some light on yeah. on that area for us? Yeah, I, th I think that you know, in medical fields and dental fields, I think antibiotics are kind of over prescribed, um, just to kind of you know, they, dentists maybe think that we're doing it just being safe, but antibiotics, as we know, it's not good for the overall body's gut health. Um, I think antibiotics can only really be treat, used if there's an acute infection. Uh, but we can also drain pus and acute infection instead of doing that. So very rarely will I need to do an antibiotic prophylaxis, or which is when they take antibiotics before a cleaning. So someone that says their doctor tells me I need to take an antibiotic before my cleaning. Well, let's take a deeper look at their health history and figure out exactly why the doctor said that, because maybe I can save that person from needing antibiotics before that, before okay. that procedure. So definitely it's not a mandatory for everyone. Not for everyone. No, um, no. Can you think of a situation where somebody definitely should take the antibiotic? So someone that has like outside swelling, extra oral swelling on the outside of their face, their cheeks are all swollen. That's probably what I'm going to say. You need to take some antibiotics and go to the emergency room. Okay. Right. So there is a time. 
Yes. But it's just not as common as what is what many dentists recommend. Yeah, yeah. For a little pimple inside the mouth, um, a lot of dentists will say, "Yeah, let's get an antibiotic in there, and it can help." But the real the real solution to that is getting the infection out. The infection is attached to the tooth, so the tooth needs to be out. That's infected. The infected tooth needs to be removed properly, and that will, that's what's going to help take the infection out. Okay. What's your take on probiotics in the mouth? Do you do any, mm -hmm. any kind of probiotic at all or recommend any probiotics dentally? Yeah, I think probiotics are really good for the mouth. It helps keep the good bacteria there. Uh, we use ozone. We don't use any kind of antibiotic when we do our cleanings or making sure that we get rid of bacteria. So ozone doesn't kill the good bacteria. It, it, it keeps the good bacteria there. It just kills the pathogens and viruses inside the mouth. So when you're, when you're extracting like a root canal, for example, mm -hmm. that's infected, you're not going to... You're not going to necessarily give an antibiotic. You'll give. You'll use an ozone treatment directly in the yeah. mouth. I use ozonated water, ozonated oxygen, and I, you know, I clean out all the infection manually. So there's no reason to prescribe an antibiotic for that. Okay. Yeah. So no, no, just in cases then. No. Because that's no. again. But that's, that's why dentists will do it just in yeah. case to, to think that they're they're covering their back, but really it doesn't. Well, do I know in my world of gluten sensitivity, like an antibiotic is the quickest way to get a yeast overgrowth, mm -hmm. a candida overgrowth. And, and a lot of people don't even realize that candida produces a protein that mimics gluten. So now they're, they're, they're having gluten-like reactions as a result of being on the antibiotic and they didn't even know, you know, that, you know, it, yeah, so I'm glad we're talking about this yeah. because I think so many people are scared. Like mm -hmm. we've just had this fear of uh, this germophobia for so long. Yeah that they, they tend to gravitate really quickly toward that antibiotic. Yeah, they're, they're thinking that antibiotic will save them, but it's not. It's not the fact that you need an antibiotic, you just need to have the infection removed, and that's what we do as biological dentists, we remove the infection. So they don't need to rely on that. Okay, so we've covered pain medicines, uh, we've covered antibiotics, uh, mm -hmm. anesthesia. Let's talk a little bit about that. We, you mentioned yeah. it earlier that, that with anesthesia you use what's biocompatible for the, for the patient. Okay. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit. Is there mm -hmm. any more detail around anesthesia that you could that you Yeah, so, so there's so many different types of local anesthesia. It's where they give you a shot to get that tooth numb. Um, there's different types, and we can check compatibility to see what, the most, what people are most compatible with, the individual. Um, but the, what I like to use is something without epinephrine in it because epinephrine, I find, increases the heart rate. Um, and in most... Anesthetics have epinephrine, and because it makes it work faster, it makes it work longer. But if there is some, there is some that don't have epinephrine, and that's what I like to use uh, because it helps healing. You know, our lower heart rate makes sure that the patient will heal better. Well, yeah, well. yeah, yeah, it makes sense. You're not putting them in fight or flight with yeah. the medication, you and keep they can them stay in parasympathetic. Parasympathetic mode, right? So, do you, do you run essential oils in your office when you're doing surgery, like so that? Yeah. Yeah. We, we have essential oil diffusers throughout the office, and it kind of helps people feel more relaxed. Um, I have a couple of things, actually, I do to help patients feel relaxed. We have, we have a TV on the ceiling. We can play, like, relaxing music. I have a therapy dog in my office, and he's under training right now, but people love having therapy dogs that are hypoallergenic around as well. So. What kind of dog is it? Oh, it's a golden doodle. A golden doodle. Yeah, you know, the ones that don't shed or anything. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. They have a Yorkie f for that very reason. Because they don't shed, right? They don't yeah, shed. The but then I have a long-haired German Shepherd that sheds everywhere, so oh. like they make up for each other. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, interesting. So uh, uh, essential oils for calm, relaxation, music, therapy mm -hmm. dog. Because yeah. I know a lot of people are super anxious about going to the dentist. Like it's like, you know, I'm not. I never, I never really have been. But I don't like the sound of the drill. Yeah. Right. And yeah, that, yeah. that that does give. We my have the noise canceling headphones, it, so we don't have to hear that. The TV, if you want to watch Netflix, um, we can go further. A lot of people are really anxious about surgery, so we can actually do IV sedation, where they're very very sleepy during that whole procedure. So it can really help with that. What, what's your opinion on gas? Oh, nitrous. Mm -hmm. So depending on genetics and stuff like that, but I do have nitrous. It's available. I recommend that. You know, we can find out if they have an MTHFR gene to see if we need to supplement with B12 because it can make people really tired with that B12 loss. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. This, is, <laughs> this has been a great conversation. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add? Is there anything you feel like we missed that... that um... mm, well, I just wanted to also say that we also, as a, as a biological dentist, I do treat uh, sleep disorders. 
um, and that can be related to someone that feels tired after sleeping for like eight hours. Maybe they snore at night or they're just not getting enough oxygen. So that's something else that I can help you with just as a dentist. A lot of people think, oh, my dentist can't help me because of snoring and all that stuff. So if you're thinking that you might need a CPAP, I have some solutions that can help people not use a CPAP. I'm glad you bring that up because CPAPs are disgusting to me. Like the, yeah. the machine themselves, the mask, um, first of all, they emit the smells that they emit and the chemicals that they emit, you know, to force that air into you, you're forcing chemicals into you, but also the potential for infection bacteria and, and mold and other things to, to infest into that mask. So talk to us, what, are, what is that option? What, what do you do to open okay. people's airway? Yeah, so um, airway restriction is what causes people to like wake up at night and start gasping for air maybe. That's, that's already when someone has sleep apnea, right? But now, nowadays I find that a lot of people have small mouths. Like back centuries ago, we had people that had really good development of the mouth, like a wide jaw, a good sized mouth that would fit the tongue back when we had lots of chewing forces, like in the, you know, centuries ago, we had people that would have to hunt and scavenge, <laughs> scavenge for like their food. They have to have raw meat and they actually get a lot more chewing action when they're growing. But nowadays you have baby food and so kids don't even chew in much. Like, you know, they don't chew enough. So bones don't develop wide and they have these really skinny mouths, like kind of like mine, I have that too. So you have a really skinny face, a really small mouth and there's no space for the tongue. So when you're breathing and sleeping, your tongue really just blocks all the oxygen from coming into the body and you won't feel rested no matter how, how you sleep. So my solution for that is actually growing the mouth to the right size. A lot of kids have this as, you know, little kids um, can expand that mouth. But even as an adult, even as an adult, you, we can actually grow mouths without doing surgery, without breaking jaw bones. We can grow it slowly, millimeter by millimeter uh, over time. So... What, it, what does that take? I mean, is that is that a year long kind of a treatment? Is that six months? What it would typically? It's about two years typically. Okay, two so kind of like wearing, braces. Wearing an appliance, a removable appliance, uh, like a brace, um, every night. Okay. Not so. all day, just just in the evenings and at night. So it's like part time braces. Yeah, it's not even fixed braces. <laughs> it's very easy. It's like a retainer. Like a retainer. Okay. Yeah. And that just puts pressure to help expand. Yeah, it puts it mouth. puts pressure on certain stem cell uh, areas in the mouth to grow that. Interesting stem cell. Mm -hmm. So it says it stimulates growth. Basically. Stimulates growth based on the stem cells. Yeah. Nice, nice. So, wow! I didn't realize that that Dennis could treat mm -hmm. sleep apnea in that way. That's very yeah. good to know. And I'm, thanks for sharing that with us. Did we did we miss anything else? Can you think? Is there any other kind of pearls mm -hmm. that you can pull out for us? Um, oh, whitening. We actually talked about whitening already, but people that want that Hollywood white smile, we have treatments, you know, there's lots of whitening treatments out nowadays. There's one with that fancy, like, blue light. Um, I just want to let viewers know that that's a gimmick. It actually does dry out teeth, and it makes them sensitive. So what, it, what you want to look for in a whitening treatment is something that doesn't cause sensitivity, you, because whitening treatments make teeth sensitive because it dries them out. Um, so I would, I would like to use something called Core in my office. I use that. And Core is really good because it doesn't cause sensitivity at all. And um, it what, actually... What is, how do you spell that? Oh, that was K-O-R. Only, it's only um, professional, professionals can do that. Okay. We can give it to them to take home. We can, we can get take home kits. Or they can do it in the office if they want that, you know, step above just removing some surface stains. With peroxide. Yeah. Yeah, so, so is core a peroxide based? Yes, type it's, of a, it's a peroxide based, but it's just higher concentration. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So, key note there is if you want a, a deeper whiten, whitening mm -hmm. effect without drying out your teeth, ask your dentist about core. Yeah, ask about K O R, core whitening. Okay. That was really good. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a great conversation. <laughs> uh, learned a lot myself, which, which it doesn't happen very often, but so I appreciate, appreciate okay, you bringing your knowledge to the table. Um, can you, can you leave any final parting words? How can people find you if they're mm -hmm. interested in biological dentistry and they want to make an appointment or come by and see you? Oh, yeah. Well, I am actually located not too far from Dr. Osborne. I'm in Sugarland. It's southwest of Houston. My office is called Pure Holistic Dental. Um, they can find me on Google, search me, call our office to make an appointment. You know, our website is pureholisticdentist.com.
All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. George, for being with me today. <laughs> no problem. I appreciate your time. That was really fun.